I first met Ashley Judd about 15 years ago, I think. Uh, we were working on a project together. We had an immediate connection and uh, we've been chosen family ever since. And so I'm so glad to call her one of my chosens. And um, she's always one of the first people to read my books and she was one of the first to read Lark Ascending. So I'm anxious to hear what questions you have for me, Ashley. Oh, Silas, it's so good to be with you today. And I'm so very proud to have my very own copy of Lark Ascending, which my partner and I are reading aloud to each other. And if you have the opportunity to enjoy this book aloud, I highly recommend doing so because it just is so deep and so true and so beautiful. And I have many questions, um, Silas, but I suppose there, there are two in particular about which I'm real curious. One is um, the book strikes me to be so much about relationship our relationship with each other, our relationship with our environment, our relationship with ourselves. And I know that you are a person of deep relationship with the God of your understanding, with your partner, with your four leggeds, um, with the good earth. And would you just speak a little bit about the role that relationship either plays in your life or, or your relationship with your writing process or, or relationship with climate, just whatever bubbles up with you in, in that very broad and yet deeply personal question about relationship? Well, it's everything, you know, it's, um, it's what it's all about, ultimately. And um, I think I'm always writing about family, the complications of family, blood family and created family. And both of those things are really important to me. Both th those things are very similar, but they're also very different. And so it's just endlessly fascinating to write about those aspects. Writers worry a lot about plot. I worry a lot about creating characters and then putting them in relationships with other characters. And then the story just, you know, happens organically. You don't even have to really worry about that. It's all about one person's reaction to another character, you know, and in this book, uh, the main character forms, creates a family with another person and with a dog. And so I think that, you know, we both have deep connections to animals. And I, I think a whole lot of people do. Um, and, and their family too, to a whole lot of us. And of course, you know, I mean, my relationship with the natural world is one of my most important ones. There's nothing that is more soothing and healing to me than walking outside or being by, the, by a body of water. Um, I mean, one of my favorite things about visiting you is often you'll say, let's get a quilt and go out here and sit under the trees, you know, and make a little picnic. And you always take a bunch of books and have a whole big long conversation outside so you know it's those connections those similarities that make relationships happen i think and some of my favorite memories of our times together is that you'll read aloud to me jason will read aloud to me you'll allow me to read some of my writing to you and those just make precious memories yes. and this character lark he has the family into which he is born which is a, a solid family and they make a blended family um he makes a bonded pair with someone in that blended family and then he has to go out and create a family during this mm -hmm. climate disaster and one of the things that really struck me about the the challenges you know i think when we all start reading um literature in school they call it man of course but there's we have our we have our challenges with nature we have our challenges with others and we have our challenges with ourselves and this book has all three and it does it in both a profound and a delicate way and it's not it's not heavy-handed and but one of the things that i that i really found so striking and important um and and you do it in such a precise way um again without it being heavy-handed is that the the lead character of this book one assumes is a white character 
and yet we often think of climate as disproportionately affecting brown and black people. And so I really appreciate how this disaster comes home for what is still at this point a slender majority of the population. And I wonder if you if you would say a few words about that. Yeah, I'm so glad you asked that because I was thinking a lot about how we as Americans, we hear about a refugee crisis and we're sad about it for a minute and then we go on with our day and it doesn't, you know, we don't think it really has much to do with us. Um, and so I really wanted to put Americans in refugee boats. I really wanted to put us in the shoes of the people we so easily overlook and don't think about. And I think, you know, part of the reason that a lot of us find it easy to put that in the back of our backs of our minds is because a lot of times those refugees don't look like us or they have a very different way of life from us, et cetera, et cetera. And so that's one thing I was thinking a lot about was <clears throat> in climate change, you know, the people who are going to be uh, the most affected by that in a negative way are poor people um, and mostly people not from America. However, America is going to be, I mean, we're already, you know, seeing tremendous forest fires and historical flooding that's happened, you know, recently right here in Kentucky. So nobody is going to be free of this. So that's one reason that people should start thinking about it. But also, I just think that a novel, to me, one of the purposes of a novel is to conjure empathy and to put us in the shoes of other people. Um, that's one of my goals as a novelist. Yes. And as someone, of course, who has spent a considerable amount of time with displaced, displaced people in Congo and Syrian refugees in Turkey and at the Azraq and Zachary camps in Jordan, I thank you so much for that. It's very arresting and very eye-opening. And you, you, you do the, the terrain of the natural world so facilely and easily. You transition from the sea to the mountains to the emerald pastures of Ireland so well. Um, it's a compliment to you. And also just a, a curiosity, your deep weddedness to your love for the world. It's so embedded in, in Appalachia. Mm -hmm. Can you just say something about how being a child of the mountains has allowed you to be, um, this universal citizen of the natural world. Well, I think I'm just, I'm so thankful that I grew up in a time and a place when I could just sort of run wild and be free. You know, we stayed outside all the time. We played in the Creek, we played in the woods and, you know, we were just always using nature. Um, and we were a part of nature and it was just, you know, Somehow it was it was a very normal part of everyday life, but at the same time, we always recognized the magic of it. I don't quite know how we struck that balance. Um, <clears throat> but I also think being a walker really puts me in touch with the natural world in a different way. Um, I walk at least three or four miles every day. Having a beagle helps with that because, you know, he likes to walk. But... Um, when you're walking, you know, you just see the world differently. Um, and I'm a person who likes to stay busy. You know, I, I was raised with a really, uh, this mentality that you had to always be productive. You have to always be doing something. <clears throat> and it took me a while to understand that sitting still by a Creek is being productive in a whole different way it's a kind of productive stillness that in a way is the most productive time for me, for my brain. That's when my writing really happens is when I am sitting down and being still and I'm just sitting by, you know, a body of water, preferably or a tree and have a dog nearby. That's my Zen, you know? And something we have in common is walking and reading at the same time. <laughs> yes. 
Yeah, I walk, I walk in a circle around our property, you know, all the way around it, and I'll just read the whole time. It's, it is sort of monk like, I guess, is kind of what I always think of. Um, but it is a real meditative practice for me that is so important to my everyday. When I'm engrossed in a good book, I mean, I don't want to put it down, even if I'm walking. I remember being in East Hampton and doing a play there one summer and walking down the street while reading and getting some very strange <laughs> books, but hey. Yeah. And the book is, is, is very much about loss and grief, and yet there are um, profound connections of renewal that yeah. are made. Can you speak to that a little bit? Well, when you're writing a book that's deeply rooted in grief, you have to find the hope. You have to find those moments of wonder and beauty and um, memories and uh, reclaiming your happiness. You know, you have to look for those. So on one hand, I wanted the book to be an examination of deep grief as I have known it. Not only the grief of losing somebody very close to you, but also the grief of losing your country. And I, I think a whole lot of us have felt that grief, you know, in varying degrees, whether that be witnessing, you know, what we perceive as the demise of democracy or the way climate change is making us lose things as well. So it's about this huge kind of global grief, but also a real personal grief. And the only way that Lark gets through it is the only way I've gotten through it. You know, it's by uh, latching on to, the, you know, the things that get you through. Um, in his case, it's walking. He loves books. He loves to read. He loves dogs. He loves the natural world. So, you know, people always say, how autobiographical is this book? Well, people probably won't say that as much on this book because it's set 20 years in the future. Yet in many ways, it's my most autobiographical book because I'm revealing so much about the grief that I've experienced over the last few years. I know in my own grief that sometimes there are just these very private, deeply intimate um, both physical experiences and then um, I don't know how to describe the next piece, but I'm gonna I'm gonna cite a line from from your book that just touch a, a, a chord that keep us going, such as when Lark finds fresh water in Ireland for the first time. You describe him taking great handsfuls and gulps of this water that tastes like moss and minerals, mm -hmm. and and that can keep a body going. You know that sort of preternatural connection with quenching an ancient thirst. And then that line we we talk about something being smaller than squirrel's ears. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, leaves. You know, yes, when the leaves are smaller than squirrel's ears, and and there's just something about those small moments that can really keep us going. And so I want to thank you for writing a book that is beautiful and aching and heartfelt and soul stirring, and is the kind of book that addresses urgent, necessary things that are of our time and that also keep a body going. Dark Ascending by Silas House. Thank you so much. You know, as, I've, as I've told you privately, you're one of the people that helps me so much as a writer to think about these really profound things. I admire so much the way that you are always so conscientious and you've taught me so much about empathy and compassion and and particularly a thing we talk a lot about, the God of our own understanding, you know, the most profound thing, I guess. And so I, I can't thank you enough for, for reading the book and for your friendship. I love you and it's a pleasure and an honor and I'm so excited for the world to discover this book along with us. I love you. Thank you so much for reading it. <laughs>